Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now, I knew as soon as I saw the delivery man struggling up my garden path with this hefty cardboard box between his hands that my cheap Core i7 gaming PC had arrived. The cheapest Core i7 gaming PC in fact. At £150 from CEX or SEX as I believe it's pronounced, bye bye monetization, I knew that it probably wouldn't be capable of much in modern games, but there was more to my buying decision. We'll get into that later. After attacking the packaging with some children's safety scissors for a good half an hour, the shiny white chassis was finally revealed. Not my colour of choice admittedly, but from a content creation perspective, the lack of precise specifications on the listing made this unboxing all the more exciting. That's the thing with CEX's second-hand goods. The basic specs are always listed, but the finer details like the motherboard RAM, hard drive and case models, as well as the type of case used, are generally absent. Their products are always graded and come with a 24-month warranty, which is usually unheard of with second-hand goods. And although I won't be keeping this for two years, probably not even two weeks, the peace of mind here is much appreciated. Upon opening the side panel, I was almost certain of a couple of things. The first was that considering this is a first Gen i7 build based on the 1366 socket, we'd have a half decent motherboard. Those who built 1366 machines back in the day meant business, and these old boards still fetch a pretty penny. Opening this was like cracking into a time capsule. A time capsule with decent cable management, I should add. The huge heatsink and fan also meant that we were ready for some serious overclocking right out of the box. And although I knew that the extra speed might be wasted in pairing with the included graphics card, a boost to the core frequency could prove instrumental in allowing the i7 to keep up with newer GPUs. For now though, I'd be making do with this stock pairing. I always advise testing any secondhand pre-built system or individual component before cleaning them. That way, if they don't work, you know that it wasn't you who broke them. But to avoid someone else's skin particles flying all over my room, as the multiple fans started to spin, I decided to give it a quick blast with the air duster before the initial switch on. Making sure everything works as it should is always my first priority and, as I pushed down on the power button for what might have been the first time in a long time, I was relieved to see the X58A UD3R motherboard light up, the CPU fans start to spin and the 425W Enemax PSU powering the whole thing not burst into a ball of flames. I'm not sure if 425W unit was the right choice here but I think it's a good brand and if it's been in here for all these years is, well, surely that's a testament to its reliability. After checking that the processor wasn't running hotter than a flaming Roadrunner, I booted into Windows with the stock settings and headed straight for the graphics card driver page. It's no secret that the NVIDIA 600 cards are unsupported bar security updates, but the 660 Ti still sells well and I'm curious as to how it'll hold up in newer titles. While I waited for the drivers to download, I also discovered this little door which concealed the front fans. It would make sense to have this open all the time for the best airflow, or at least cracked. With the drivers successfully installed, I then booted up The Witcher 3 and played for a little while to test stability and temperatures. As expected, the blower style MSI 660 Ti runs warm. It's even more important to clean up and repaste this style of card when buying second hand to try and keep temps as low as possible. I like to remove the loose dust from the fan fins as well with a soft brush. It can be a bit fiddly, but repasting a GPU usually just involves removing all the screws and lifting the heatsink off the PCB, cleaning the chip itself, applying new thermal paste, and then putting everything back together. Repasting a processor isn't as time consuming, especially if you buy one separately, because it will probably not have any paste on it. When it comes to pre-builds though, it's simply a matter of finding how the cooler comes off, in this case a handful of screws, removing it and the CPU itself, dusting the cooler, fan and wiping the old paste off the processor. I used the air duster once again for the heatsink and a cloth for the fan fins. I then applied new thermal paste to the CPU before putting the heatsink and fan back on top of it. I'd always suggest checking that the PC still powers up fine after cleaning and reinstalling each individual component, that way if something does go wrong you can immediately pinpoint the problem. 
You might also want to think about disassembling the entire PC and cleaning everything else more thoroughly as well, including the fans and the chassis. The less dust and grime, the better. After swapping out the hard drive for my game field SSD and overclocking the CPU to just under 3.8 GHz, it was time to game. Back in 2012, the 660 Ti was a great card and a great companion for the i7 950, but unlike the processor, the GPU has not aged very well. It had been aging well, but the last few years have been rather harsh on Nvidia's 600 and 700 series lineups. 2 gigs of VRAM just isn't enough anymore, but that's only half the problem. I've got to admit my decision to purchase this machine was based more on the i7 combo and the mystery surrounding the exact featured specs. That said, this once capable card isn't completely redundant. Red Dead Redemption 2 will run with the low settings including the low texture quality due to the VRAM limitation. The card fares better in more open areas as opposed to busier towns. GTA 5 poses no problem for the 660 Ti as expected. I didn't dare try and overclock the card as the cooler isn't really good enough to do so. It might have been possible to squeeze a few extra megahertz out of it with a far higher fan speed, but I don't really think it would add much to the performance in most games these days anyway. Imagine my surprise when I found out that Cyberpunk 2077 ran with an average of at least 30 FPS. Imagine my disappointment when I noticed the frame drops. Last time I tested this game with this card, I'm not sure if I made a video or not, the game ran poorly but it didn't stutter quite as much. The 1.5 game update probably doesn't agree with the outdated Nvidia drivers. Lowering the resolution or enabling FSR doesn't help either in case you were wondering. Remember that we are using a 13 year old CPU though, which probably doesn't help things. The always reliable Forza Horizon 5 ran with at least 30 FPS at 1080p. No resolution provides a flawless experience with dips and drops occurring at 720 and 900p as well. A frame rate cap does help a little bit but there are still some noticeable frame time problems. Don't forget that despite the i7 itself being pretty old we do have 8 gigs of memory as well which might not be enough in certain modern releases. Although once a high-end chip, the i7 isn't what it used to be, but it'll be interesting to see how things improve after switching out the graphics card and adding more memory at a later date, probably in the next video to be honest. Fortnite runs fine, there's a few dips and drops as always, but it's very much playable and once again, a 60 FPS cap would really help. I really like the old 1366 platform, it really is old but gold. Finally, CSGO, a CPU intensive game, has no issues here either. As a whole, I'm happy with this PC as a starting point. Whenever I see a custom first gen i7 machine for sale, I can't help but wonder just what other components are included. And in this case, we got a decent motherboard with a beefy cooler ready for some out of the box overclocking. With some extra RAM and a new graphics card, I'm excited to see what this chip can really do these days, but that is an experience for another video. Thank you very much for watching this one then. If you enjoyed it, leave a like down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know if you're still using a first generation i7 or a 660 Ti for that matter. And hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.